Joe Biden. Okay, I'd like to welcome everybody to the 1916 lecture series here at the Cayley Club. And let us start tonight as we always start with a moment of silence for all those who have given their lives in the cause of Irish freedom. Thank you very much. Um, we have a Zoom program. We have many people on Zoom, including people from the other side of the pond who hopefully we'll hear from later. But just to give some background here, the 1916 committee has been having a monthly lecture series going back to 2015. And we hope to continue till 3015 as possible. And the goal is what? Till yeah, Ireland is yeah. free, whatever comes first. Thank you, mm -hmm. <laughs> and let's hope Ireland's free before then. Um, last month, we had a lecture here. Marie McGee and Mary uh, Beth Lynch did a fine job describing the times that Frederick Douglass spent in Ireland. Uh, next month, November, we don't have we had a cancellation, so we don't have anything scheduled right now. But we guarantee you, November nineteenth, there will be a lecture here and it'll be educational and entertaining. December 10th, a very interesting thing. Please mark this in your calendar. Tim Hoyt from the Newport Navy War College will speak on the 100th anniversary of the treaty that ended the War of Independence in Ireland. He's going to highlight on the meeting between De Valera and Lord George and discuss at length the debate that happened in the Irish Parliament over the treaty. This is an area of Irish history that is very sensitive, let's say, and a lot of people don't like to deal with or talk about it. It's great that we have an academic like Tim, a true historian, who's going to come in and deliver the lecture. And he told me that in June and July, he's going to be traveling in Ireland, giving the same presentation to historical societies over there if you know people can travel back and forth. So that's a very good one to try to make December 10th. It's gonna be here. It's gonna be right here at the Cayley Club where all our lectures are. Um, at the end of this lecture, there'll be I'll be able to come back and we have about five or six upcoming events in the next five or six weeks that are very interesting for Irish Americans that I'll go through a list of them and people can put it in their calendar. But right now, um, I'd like to introduce a speaker. We are so lucky to have this speaker, Tricia McIv McIvay. MacGyver. 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 <laughs> I should go by uh, Facebook. <laughs> Patricia MacGyver from Derry. And uh, Tricia has spoken several times at this lecture series. And every time, it's been brilliant. It's been entertaining. She, unlike most of us here who are Americans, she grew up in the six counties, she grew up under British occupation and she truly has a sense of what uh, people went through over there. Tonight, she'll be talking about exactly that. She was speaking on the legacy issue, which has been in the news over there in Ireland for the past couple of months as the British government once again tries to squash investigations into the murder of innocent Irish men and women. Trisha will fill you in on that. I'd just like to make one comment on that for the Americans here that is sometimes difficult for us to wrap our heads around. But it is a truth that justice should be served and that the police and military are the front lines of upholding that justice. And in certain situations, we see that that doesn't happen. I referenced the George Floyd killing uh, last spring. The first police report that came out from that day was that George Floyd was handcuffed, had a medical emergency and died on the way to a hospital. Video showed what actually happened and he was murdered by a cop kneeling on his neck. That's egregious and it's unusual. It's not what we are used to dealing with in this country, but everybody saw it for what it was and it was cops trying to get away with murder. Trisha is gonna explain just how, unfortunately, how often that happened in the six counties, both cops and soldiers getting away with murder. So with that, please pay attention. It's a good educational opportunity. At the end, we'll have questions for Trish and hopefully be able to speak to the people on Zoom. 
So again, welcome everybody and welcome Trisha. Gum hidden from prying eyes, Gavin McShane's killer casually walked into a small taxi depot in Armagh. It was May 18, 1994. Gavin and his pal Shane were playing a video game at the back of the waiting area. The lone gunman entered the arcade, produced a handgun, and fired first at the dispatch operator and then turned his gun on Gavin and Shane. It was as calculated as it was brutal. At point blank range, each were shot in the head. Gavin died instantly and Shane died later that day in hospital. At 17, their lives were over. The conflict in Ireland has left thousands bereaved and hurting. The war is over, but the legacy of the conflict remains with us. The pain for many, like Gavin's family, is as real today as it was when their loved ones were murdered. And for several decades, they have attempted to uncover the truth. But a campaign has been waged against victims' families, involving repeated delays and lengthy legal obstructions, waged at the highest level within the British state. This campaign includes the prevention and undermining of the effectiveness of investigations the deliberate withholding of information and the willful destruction of documentation. And after all this time, grieving families have never given up hope. But earlier this year, they were dealt a devastating blow. When the British government declared its intention to stop all investigations into crimes committed by British forces during the three decades of conflict. The proposal amounts to an unconditional amnesty for all British agents, service personnel, as well as the paramilitaries. And it seeks to draw a legal veil over Britain's role and its dirty war tactics in Ireland. So why would the British government want to unilaterally shut down all investigations? against the wishes of all concerned parties across the divide in the north of Ireland? The answer, I believe, lies in the history of the conflict. Tonight, I intend to tell you about where it all began and relate to you some of the stories of the victims. You will be able to draw your own conclusions as to why the British government is desperate to shut down these investigations. Over five decades ago, the British dispatched thousands of troops to reinforce the pro-unionist government in the six counties. And as you know, at that time, basic civil rights were denied to Catholics through gerrymandering and systemic discrimination. And during that time, there were many, many controversial killings carried out by agents of the state, whether that be British soldiers in uniform on the streets of Belfast and Derry, or through British undercover operations, or by directing loyalist paramilitary groups. British troops were backed up in Northern Ireland by the police force, known as the Royal Ulster Constabulary, or the RUC, and also by loyalist paramilitary forces, the most notable being the Ulster Volunteer Force, the UVF, and the Ulster Defence Association, the UDA. In all, over the course of the Troubles, some 1,400 people were killed by these groups. That is, British soldiers, the RUC, and Loyalist paramilitaries. And it's worth noting that only four British soldiers have ever been found guilty of killings in the North. They served short sentences, and astonishingly, 
on release, they were taken back into the British Army to continue their careers. Britain's dirty war in Ireland has long been an open secret. And over the years, various sources have come to light, including declassified documents, official police and parliamentarian reports, showing a tangled web of relationships between the British government, senior police, and military officers, and loyalist murder gangs. Amongst the most grievous cases where such collusion occurred was in the murder of two high-profile human rights lawyers, Rosemary Nelson and Pat Benukin. Campaigners have fought a long protracted battle to force the British government to admit to state collusion, but thus far without success. The policy of Britain in the words of Margaret Thatcher herself, where carry on, but don't get caught. That was the message she delivered to one senior police officer in 1986, when he raised the subject of collusion with her. But the story begins long before that. The British empire and its colonial ways has left its mark on many, many countries. It is responsible for numerous massacres, famines, and the establishment of concentration camps all across the world, from Africa to India, and so many in between. However, Ireland holds a unique place in that imperial history. It was the first colony, and sadly still remains one of the last. One of the architects of British policy in Ireland was Brigadier Frank Kitson. Now he was dispatched to Northern Ireland in 1970. And he had already spent decades in other British colonies, refining old techniques and developing new ones in clandestine wars, which were now to be waged against the nationalist people. His policy led to the beginning of assassinations on the streets of Derry and Belfast. It was designed to terrorize the nationalist communities. Psychological warfare techniques were developed and these involved inhumane and degrading treatment of innocent interned Catholics. Torture interrogation techniques were carried out in the infamous police centers like the well-known Castle Ray. Kitson and his colleagues were also responsible for the development of military death squads named the British Military Reconnaissance Force. Now this force deserves a special mention. They were a gang of elite British special forces numbering about 40. And the force ranks as one of the murkiest and morally dubious representations of the British state. <coughs> This undercover army unit deployed soldiers in civilian clothing in unmarked cars to carry out surveillance and shootings on the streets of Belfast. They also recruited agents from within paramilitary groups and then directed them to carry out their dirty work. But they certainly weren't opposed to carrying out their own murders. <coughs> they are responsible for many drive-by shootings and targeted assassinations of unarmed civilians in the nationalist communities. More than half of their victims were teenagers, the youngest being 15 years of age. Now one alleged member of this elite group has been quoted as saying, we were there not to act like an army unit. We were there to act like a terror group. And another member of this group is quoted as saying, we were a legalized death squad from their own mouths. Their reign of terror only came to an end when a double agent informed the IRA and realizing that their undercover operations were blown, the unit was disbanded. Unfortunately, they were quickly replaced by another special forces unit known as the 14th Intelligence Detachment, the DET for short. Now this unit also worked in the shadows and outside of the law, 
And one of their famous operatives was Robert Nirak. He was identified as the likely leader of the group responsible for the Miami show band massacre, which I'll tell you a little more about later. And allegedly, he directed bombings in Dublin and Monaghan in Southern Ireland in 1974, which claimed the lives of 34 people, including an unborn baby. The greatest loss of life on any single day in the Troubles. Now, none of these British operatives have ever faced prosecution. Far from it. You'll read articles about them in British newspapers where they're hailed as the unsung heroes of the British Army, defenders of Queen Country. A female operative from the group was later secretly awarded the MBE by the Queen. And Robert Nierak, the British agent identified as being present at the Miami Shobat massacre, was posthumously awarded the George Cross, the highest award bestowed by the British government for gallantry. Now, Robert Nierak played a leading role in another infamous group operating during the Troubles. This group was known as the Glen Ann Gang. The gang was associated with the UVF, which was an outlawed loyalist terror organization. But the gang consisted of UVF members and serving members of the RUC, that is the police force, as well as members of a British Army regiment known as the UDR. Now this regiment was recruited from the Protestant community in the North and was one of the largest regiments in the British Army. They had access to weapons, intelligence material and protection all supplied to them by British agents. And it's estimated that this gang murdered over 120 people. Almost all of them were randomly selected Catholic civilians. They operated during the mid to early 70s in an area in Armagh and Tyrone, which would later become known as the Murder Triangle. A remarkable documentary entitled On Quiet Graves was released last year, and it gave incredible insight into the activities of this group. Through painstaking years of research, it showed beyond question that the British state was aware the Catholic men, women, and children were being shot. They weren't just aware. They ordered these murders with the clear intention of striking terror in the nationalist community. <clears throat> now, it's fair to say that in conflicts around the world, civilians are sadly often caught up in the crossfire. But it's very hard to understand how Britain could develop a deliberate policy that targeted the innocent. But that's exactly what they did in Ireland. The Glen Ann Gang, under the direction of British military intelligence, was instructed to choose unarmed Catholic civilians in an attempt to systematically terrorize, intimidate, and demoralize nationalist communities to weaken their resistance, and specifically their support for the IRA. The Miami Chauvin massacre is one example of a targeted attack which leaves a trail of evidence directly back to British intelligence. In 1975, the, My the members of the Miami show band were living the dream. They were known as the Irish Beatles, performing for thousands of adoring fans all across Ireland, North and South. The band and its audience crossed all social, religious and political divides which is why these murders were so incredibly shocking to the nation. In the wee hours of July 31st, 1975, the band were traveling home from a gig in Banbridge. The lead singer, Ireland's latest heartthrob, Fran O'Toole, was driving their minibus along an isolated stretch of country road just outside Newry. When they were flagged down, by a group of uniformed men at what appeared to be a British UDR army checkpoint. And these temporary checkpoints were not uncommon around the border roads. But the musicians were surprised 
when they were ordered out of their van and made line up on the roadside. And unbeknownst to the band, the men were all members of the Glen Ann gang, although at least four of them were also serving British Army soldiers from the UDR regiment. Now, one of the surviving band members reports that at this stage, another man in a different uniform and beret arrived on the scene. He spoke with an English accent and seemed to be the one in charge. This man fits the description of British intelligence agent, Robert Nierak. Now, while two of the gunmen were hiding a bomb on the minibus, it suddenly exploded prematurely, killing them both. And the other gunmen then opened fire on the dazed band members. And the handsome Fran O'Toole, who begged for his life, was machine gunned 22 times in the face. Another two of the musicians were chased down and killed. Remarkably, two members of the band survived. McAlee would be thrown clear by the bomb and managed to escape over a field, while Travers, who was seriously wounded, survived by playing dead. He recalls hearing someone say, come on, all those bastards are dead. I got them with dum-dums. The forensic test on the weapons revealed links to the Glen Ann gang and a series of other sectarian murders. The two dead attackers were identified as serving members of the British UDR regiment and were in uniform at the time. Three more members of the regiment were eventually convicted of the murders. And there was great outrage that serving British soldiers were responsible. But more concerned still that the leader of the gang was likely to be Captain Robert Nierak of British intelligence. That claim was further backed up when former intelligence operator, Fred Hollyrod, confirmed these suspicions. And several of the culprits responsible for this massacre were also associated and suspected of being involved in the Dublin Monaghan bombings. Now, one might wonder what possible reason British intelligence could have for killing innocent musicians. The plan had been to place the bomb in the minibus with a timer set to go off 10 minutes later, killing all and framing the band as IRA bomb smugglers. It has been suggested that the ultimate goal was to persuade the Irish government to deploy stricter security measures on their side of the border to prevent further IRA operations in the area. So the British were willing to sacrifice innocent civilians to achieve this goal. How little they valued Irish lives. So young Gavin McShane, who I spoke of earlier, is one of those murder cases in which collusion between the British state and the loyalist paramilitaries has been alleged. Gavin's mother, Maria, has campaigned for justice for decades. And the sad irony of her story is that she herself was a victim of another case of collusion when she was injured in a bombing of a local bar in Katy. Now, she lost an eye in that bomb, but at the time, she was also pregnant, and there was great concern for her unborn child. But in January of the following year, Maria delivered a healthy baby boy. She named her miracle baby, Gavin. Maria had survived that bomb attack only to suffer the horrible loss of her precious child, Gavin, 17 years later. In her own words, she explained, I suppose given that he survived it, there was always something very special about him. And yet this fear that something awful might happen. Now, no one has been convicted of Gavin's murder and perhaps hardly surprising when we now know the wider extent and the systemic collusion that existed at the time. In Gavin's case, the murderer did not wear a mask. He was recognized by local people who gave witness statements. 
he also was ungloved and left his fingerprints on a car as he made his escape. And some of the bullets from the scene inexplicably went missing. Now this would have been critical to ballistics in the identification of the murder weapon. And the clothes worn by Gavin and his murdered friend Shane were incinerated without any permission from the family to do so. And that's important because the killer was so close to his victims that he could easily have transferred DNA to their clothing. Now there were numerous other inconsistencies in the investigation, far too many to mention. And the fight for truth by the McShane family continues, but Maria through ill health is no longer able to campaign, but the fight has been taken up by, brothers, by Gavin's sisters. And after all this time, people have asked, why don't you just give up? Gavin's sister answers this question. Gavin went to school one day and came back home in a coffin. He didn't do anything wrong in his life. So why should we give up on him? We're entitled to truth and justice for Gavin. Time might have healed the wounds if only we had received justice whenever it happened. But you can't heal if you don't have answers. And those answers have been locked away and evidence destroyed. The next story I'd like to tell you about is that of a young lawyer named Pat Finucane. His murder in 1989 is one of the most notorious of the troubles, a murder with collusion at its heart. Now, Pat grew up on the Falls Road in Belfast in a working class family, and he was inspired by the civil rights struggle. He was also influenced by the injustices he saw around him. And so he chose a career in the law where he might be in a position to challenge some of these injustices. He studied at Trinity College Dublin and became a human rights lawyer. He defended both Republicans and loyalists alike, for he believed that if you were arrested, you had rights, no matter what side of the divide you came from. And his vocation in life was to vindicate and defend these rights. He was hardworking, conscientious, and very skillful at his job. He started to practice in Belfast and his reputation grew. He, walked, he, excuse me, he worked long demanding hours to defend many political prisoners. And every time Pat identified a legal protection for citizens, the British simply changed the law. The result was new repressive laws designed to maximize the power of the state and reduce the rights of the individuals. Pat was at the forefront of the legal challenges to these coercive measures. And he was a familiar face on television news, often seen leaving courtrooms around the north of Ireland. His diligence and his success in these matters made him a hate figure for the RUC and the British political establishment. In November 1988, four senior police officers from the RUC met with a British minister named Douglas Hogg. And the subject of that meeting was how to deal with human rights lawyers, who the RUC claimed without a shred of evidence were effectively in the pockets of terrorists. Now Hogg asked, who are these lawyers? They identified Pat Finucane. Two months later in the British parliament, this minister announced as a fact that there were lawyers in the north of Ireland sympathetic to the IRA. And with that, Pat's fate was sealed. Less than four weeks later, agents for British military intelligence shot Pat and his wife Geraldine in front of their children as they sat for Sunday dinner. And those who plotted and planned this murder within the British government in conjunction with the RUC and the aforementioned British Army Reconnaissance Unit thought that they had silenced a good man and thought they had sent a clear message. To them, it was a job well done. But they had not accounted for the courage and resilience of Pat's wife, Geraldine, who survived the attack and Pat's many friends and supporters. Now, despite attempts at obstruction, inept superficial investigations and intimidation, 
the Finucan family could not be silenced. However, they have still not been granted an official inquiry into Pat's death. And this is despite a decision reached by a Supreme Court ruling stating that the British government's failure to properly investigate this murder was a breach of the European Convention to Human Rights. The British government did sanction three inquiries to be held by Sir John Stevens concerning collusion in Northern Ireland between loyalists and state security forces. But from the outset, Stevens recounts a concerted campaign to discredit his inquiry in the media. And he encountered a wall of silence as well as sabotage of documents. The Stevens files were stored in a police facility, which was generally considered one of the most secure in the UK. Now, several members of Stevens' team returned unexpectedly one evening to discover the incident room where their files were stored was on fire. Very strangely, the fire alarms malfunctioned that night and the heat sensitive intruder alarm also failed. And when the members of the investigative team ran to the guardhouse to call for emergency services, they were told that the phones were not functioning. During this inquiry, Stephen said that of the 110 men he arrested and questioned in connection with Pat Finucane's murder, 107 were being paid as British agents. Again, 110 involved, 107 were paid British agents. And Sir Stevens is quoted as saying, in almost 30 years as a policeman, I have never found myself caught up in such an entanglement of lies and treachery. Now he was a policeman. In his third report, he did include, he did conclude that there had been collusion. But still, this was not enough to force the British into opening inquiry into Pat Finucane's murder. And one must ask the question, what have they got to hide? So as you can tell, the British government has a lot at stake here. Collusion all the way to the halls of Westminster. The orchestrated murder of human rights lawyers, of innocent nationalist men, women, children, all disposable to the British Empire. It happened by design. The scale was huge. And the aim was to terrorize, intimidate, and demoralize a whole section of the community to weaken their resolve to resist. So perhaps now you understand the motivation behind this outrageous proposal by Boris Johnson to introduce legislation to conveniently shut down all avenues of investigation into trouble-related deaths. It's designed to deliver the ultimate cover-up of Britain's dirty war in Ireland. And it makes a mockery of the previous agreements signed up to by British government, including the Good Friday Agreement and the Stormont Agreement. But as we know, their word means nothing. And so there are hundreds of stories like this, hundreds of families fighting for truth. And over the decades, members of these families have passed away, never seeing justice. But the torch has been passed on to a new generation. The pain caused to thousands of people is just incredible. And if there's ever going to be a healing process, if we are ever going to move forward in reconciliation, people need to be able to tell their stories. And more importantly, we need the truth from the state about their role in the conflict. This new British proposal is simply incompatible with human rights. It has met with a universal outcry but to the families and the survivors, it brings a new heartbreak and a new low. And it sends the message that the Irish are disposable citizens of just another British colony. Well, we won't stand for that. 
The Irish diaspora is one of the most powerful in the world. We are a proud people, proud of our culture, our language, our stories, our music. We have a voice and we demand attention. We will not allow our fellow Irish men and women be denied human rights. The Irish diaspora was instrumental in bringing peace in the form of the Good Friday Agreement. Well, now we're going to harness that power again. Locally, we've already been successful in getting two of our House representatives on board, but we need to keep the pressure on. We need to spotlight this cause. We need to use every platform at our disposal. We need to stop Britain getting their trade deal with the US unless they can honor their agreements and finally start respecting the Irish people. Thank you. So we're very privileged tonight to be joined by Alana. And Alana is the sister of Gavin that I mentioned, Gavin McShane. And she has been involved in a, a long fight to get justice for her brother. He was her big brother. And if we can, she would like to say a few words if we can get her on Zoom and speaker tonight. So I hand you over to see if we can get Alana to say a few words. Can you hear me? Yeah, I'm just, I'm just trying to, I'm on a, sorry, my mouse. Spotlight, spotlight. There you go. Also, can everybody hear me? Yes. Yeah. Thank you very much for inviting me tonight to join you. Trish, what a powerful speech you've done there. That was amazing. Um, I couldn't have said it any better. Um, yeah, it's hard living day to day with what's going on. Like, even, you know, it's 27 years from Gavin was murdered. Um, every day you, you still fight on. You go to meetings, do interviews, anything to try and get justice for him. Um, yes, he deserves every bit of justice and we deserve the, the truth. Um, like, mummy, it, it was actually the Glenan gang that done the step in bomb that mummy was involved in and there's been no justice there either so we have actually two cases gone on um gavin he was 17 then i have a, a another brother keon he was 14 at the time and i was 12 and that morning was just a normal morning for him going to going to school and he actually missed the he missed the bus and daddy took him down the road till till school and that's a big regret that daddy has to live with um we were saying to him like he can't blame himself because he could have got a lift with somebody else Do you know gavin was determined to go to school that day so there was nothing to stop him from taking the day off so he was still going to make it till school and um, he was on, by the time he got down there, he had free class and decided to go up the town to play a computer game, which he had never been there before. And all the boys, they had left because they had to go back to class for 11 o'clock and Gavin and Shane didn't have to go in till half 11. So they stayed on to play the computer game and then the gunman walked in um, like the night before Gavin played his last world match um, he went to the novena um, with mummy do you know it, it, just our house even you know we were hit with the troubles before Gavin our house was a normal house 
we didn't even know what had happened, Mummy, until after Gavin was murdered. That then she told us how she lost her eye, and that so we were never brought up knowing anything about the troubles. Um, he was just he was such a happy go lucky seventeen year old, you know. Um, Oh, what do you, do you know, there's so much you can say about him. But it, yes, it's very hard living, knowing that if they take in an honesty, that that's it, that's it finished for us. Um, the gunman, he only lives uh, about 20 miles down the road from us. And he walks freely around his hometown. Uh, he works for an organize, organization, uh, Helping Hands, and he's in elderly homes. Um, doesn't care. Like People know what he's done. He, he won't admit to it. Um, do you know, like he's murdered so many children. It seems to be children that he targets. And um, he just, he doesn't have a care in the world. Do you know, and he's laughing now, thinking with an honesty coming in that he's going to get away with it. But we're going to keep fighting. On like, mommy, she is on her deathbed at the minute, and she's got cancer. Um, do you know, and and she has handed this over to myself and Keon, and like, definitely there was no doubt about it that me and him weren't going to take over from mummy and keep fighting and uh, we'll do everything we can to try and stop Boris Johnson from um, signing off on the anonymity because there's a lot of families is all in the same boat you know might have uh, the troubles has hit their home more than once as well and like they just can't. It it this wouldn't happen in any other country. So it wouldn't um like they would be prosecuted for it before now. Like the British government have done everything in our case, like burning Gavin's clothes and destroying his files and there was ways and means around that there. Like they could have bagged the stuff and put it into a room and it not to be touched. His files could have there could have been photographs took off the files before they burnt them, but they didn't. But everything was just a cover up and and now this here's the last option that but we're gonna try our best. And thank you for you all for standing by us as well. Do you know, it means an awful lot for America to be behind us and what a great group you have. It's an absolute pleasure to be here the night with you. I could I could talk all night, you know. Is there anything you want to ask me that I can answer or Anybody have any questions for Alana? Um, Alana, you're very brave to come on and talk. And I know maybe over the years you've had to do this. Um, yeah. You know, you're very eloquent. And I just think it's lovely to hear a little bit about Gavin. Because I read, too, that um, he was head boy or deputy head boy of the, of the school. I know he was, loved his hurling and he was, like, into his sports and a really great he student. He is an artist. He loved butterflies. That was his sort of thing that he done for all his, his artwork. And we have his paintings everywhere from my house, Keon's, mommy and daddy's. Do you know, his artwork's everywhere in the house. And his whirling stick still sitting and his helmet and even his school bag. Yeah. Do you know, and his books, his school books are still in it, the way that he left it. That's heartbreaking. Yeah, that's heartbreaking to hear. Um, and for for your mother and Gavin, I thought that was incredibly sad that they both 
were involved and that that precious baby that she probably adored after surviving and then to lose him again. Second yeah. Later. And he was our best friend. So he was, you know, he was our firstborn. Like, yes, she loved every one of us, but there was a wee connection that the two of them had. And like mummy had lost her left eye. So when she went shopping, like we things just going shopping was difficult for her. Yeah. And he used to go shopping with her and he used to walk her down one aisle and then go go down the same aisle but up the opposite side so that she, he made sure that she seen everything and um like the two of them they did have a wee bond, you know, the the war best friends. Your story is very powerful. And I think, you know, like I said, if, if, if everybody feels like I do, having you here tonight is just so heartbreaking to, and it makes it so real. So that when we're here and we're doing something, um, we, you know, we're hoping to send our solidarity to you. But hearing you talk, I think, for me anyway, makes us all the more determined that there's no way we're giving up. We are gonna keep fighting for this cause. As I've said to people, we're gonna keep the focus on it talk to your friends when you're in the bars, tell them these stories, get on social media, pass it on. Yeah. We're going to keep the focus on every yeah. can. Yeah. And follow Raldus for Justice on Facebook and Justice for Gavin McShane yeah. uh, for Facebook that, you know, then you'll be able to find out more information as, as we get it, you know, then you'll be able to see it as well. Um, you know, like posting, like if we, if we get interviews or meetings, you know, like we post them up on Facebook so people can follow them. Yes, and I, I do follow Relatives for Justice and I see their posts and hopefully maybe everyone else can be introduced to Relatives for Justice and yeah. be able to see their posts. Yeah. Yeah. And Even what he called Mark Thompson's a great fella. He would, he you know... Even to get him on mm -hmm. to talk sometime for you. And I've been kind of talking with him by email because he did come to, I was fortunate enough to meet him in Newport when he came. And uh, I've kind of been in contact with him. He sent me lots of posters and things. So I'll reach out to him again and see if there's anything else that we can do that he can direct us to do and just keep us in yeah. the updates. But yeah. Yeah. So you're up late, maybe I know. go to bed. <laughs> but I think we all really appreciate, right? Yeah. I think like Sharon. Thank you. Thank you, Alana. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Alana. Thank you. Alana, I hope to meet you someday when I come to visit. Yes, that'd be lovely. <laughs> <laughs> we'll all come, Alana, to your house, okay? <laughs> they're all welcome. If you're ever around the Armagh area, make sure and give us a shout. We will do, we will do. Take care, Alana. Take care. We'll be remembering you and your family. Take care. Thank you for sharing that with us. It was really touching. Thank you. Well, I don't know if anyone else has any questions on the subject. I'm no authority on it, but if I can answer anything, I'm happy to. <coughs> I didn't even know that part. Isn't that crazy? They have to see him every day. It's a small community. Everybody knows who did it. Yeah. There he goes. He's just going about life. And I mean, that's a common story. It's not a, it's not an unusual one. I, what I really hope to emphasize for everybody tonight is that, you know, there's no randomness to this. Yeah. It wasn't someone in the wrong place at the wrong time. I was going to say about the targeting this <coughs> Group that was yeah. so popular with everybody. Everybody, okay. they crossed all. Okay. Yeah. That's why they targeted yeah. that one 
in this country back in the 1950s. There's a lot of parallels there. We're um, becoming popular with the white kids. Yeah. And there was a lot of animosity toward people. Yeah. Kids in the, in the, or young people in the black groups because the white kids were starting to to follow them. Follow them. And so I'm thinking there may be something there this too. Is yeah. Very similar to that same story. Show me them. Uh, I mean, I could tell you stories. You know, what they did. And I don't remember, I, I can't tell you names right now, but I've read about, I mean, they, the RUC, would, they would pick up men, young men, um, and bring them in for questioning. And then they would threaten them. They would say, become an informer or else. We know your sister works such and such. We know your mother lives in that deserted farmhouse. We're going to get them. And they did. There are murders like if they couldn't get them, the, the their suspects themselves, who they thought were involved in the IRA, the way that they did it was they shot their family members. Yeah. Uh, Trish, and, I back in there again. Can you hear me? Yes. Gavin, the the reason why the gunman went to target the, the taxi rank was the owner's mother had been a witness for the UDR and she was given a statement in court and they had actually sent a bullet to the owner of the taxi rank and told her to tell her mother to withdraw her statement mm -hmm. and if she didn't that they were going to come and get her and that's the only reason why so it was Gavin and Shane shouldn't have been shot do you know Yes. They, they were shot dead because of the the gunman was going in to shoot the 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 taxi rank, yeah. you know the the owner, and yeah. because two boys was there, he shot them, and like it was the two children was murdered, and the taxi yeah one of them was injured. Yes, you know, and that's just the way it, it be. You know, it's. It's just if you're there, they're they're gonna take everybody. They're gonna shoot or bomb everybody. Just, just to, you know, because um, they weren't doing the the owner's daughter wasn't doing what they wanted her to do. Yeah, yeah. And that's just the way it is. It was just random people walking down the street. Yeah. You know. And, and the idea, I think, was to just instill terror in everyone. So, yeah. you know, the, these um, paramilitaries would have been fed intelligence information and they would have said, you know, we want so-and-so eliminated. Go after them. If you can't get so-and-so, get a family member. And whatever you do, take out some Catholics when you're there. I mean, that's right, yeah. They were being instructed to do. And they were being instructed by British agents. Yeah, the man that murdered Gavin was um, trained. He's trained by um, he's an MI five agent as well. Do you know the government had him sent off to to do his training and and protect it so well, and still to this day protect it. Yeah, I mean it's just outrageous, and you know maybe we hear about this in China or maybe in Russia. Mm -hmm. This is the British government, and this was their policy to defeat any uprising in the north of Ireland. So, you, I mean, it's no wonder they're so scared of any investigations because there's been a few successes right recently, you probably know. Um, yeah. Some inquests like the Bally Murphy um, case. And so, despite all of the, the resistance to investigations, some are getting through which has made, which I think has prompted this British government to decide we can't get any more of this information out, we need to shut it down. That's right, yeah. And uh, the more you hear about it, the more you read. Oh, sorry, I'm not paying yeah. attention. <laughs> Trish, 
Chris, um, is there any, I, is there any provisions or any, uh, I guess provisions or I would, to take into account that this is going on 40 years and a lot of the players are either dead or dying or they're getting old or anything. Yeah. Well, is it, is it still, uh, is there an effort to continue with the seeking out uh, responsibility and uh, accountability, even after everybody's, after the clock is, is, is I, you know, moved I, over. I have to say that the British are hoping that the clock runs out. Right. That is their policy. A lot of these families um, have already, members of those families have passed on and they've never seen the justice. And if you ask a lot of them, they'll say the same thing. The British are just hoping we all die, that the clock runs out, that there'll be nothing left to investigate. And um, that's why we got to get moving on this. That's why we got to get these investigations started. Um, and, you know, the, the idea is now just to close down everything. And it is true to say there's a particular case I was going to talk about it going on in Belfast or was going on about a young lad. His name was John Pat Cunningham. And in 1974, I think, um, this young man was a, um, he was an adult who was, had the mental age of somewhere between 10 and 15. And uh, he was very afraid of anybody in uniform, priests or, or police or the army. So the army came upon him one day and he ran. Because he ran, they chased him into a field and they shot him in the back. And that was 1974. Eventually, after, you know, the, the case came to court just this year. And um, a very unfortunate thing happened that the soldier involved, uh, who was now in his 80s, uh, was brought to court and very, very sadly passed away from COVID during the court case. And so that's very sad. We're, we're not really looking to, you know, these soldiers are now very elderly and they're pensioners. And the people back home are not looking for revenge. They're not looking to drag these old men into court. But because every other opportunity for investigation has been shut down. They're not allowed inquiries. It's one of the only ways that they can have access to documentation and stories by bringing these cases. Um, and now, of course, Boris Johnson is using this as a propaganda um, exercise by saying, oh, you know, those people in Ireland, they want to bring our veterans out and these poor old souls in their 80s, and now they've passed away, we're gonna stop this happening. So it is true that, you know, these, these, I feel sorry for some of these soldiers because they were just young men. They were sent out with orders, kill the natives. And if you kill the natives, we'll give you a medal. And that was their instruction. So although they hold some responsibility, really, you know, they're not the ones that are really culpable. And we really want to get at the stories of who sent them out, who ordered them, um, who developed these policies. And that's what we're after. So we don't know if that'll happen, but, but that's the goal of all this. You know, the English people, uh, I think they're victims of their own Tory government. Um, you know, you could talk about Boris Johnson, what an idiot he is, whether it's arrogance or stupidity. Um, he's backed himself into a corner. and no one in the world trusts him. I mean, you even have Fine Gael leaders talking out and saying, you know, the British can't be trusted anymore. They renege on all, their, um, all of their uh, commitments. And, you know, I personally say that's the kettle calling the pot black. However, um, it's a fact that everybody in the world is now recognizing that, you know, the European community sees them for what they are because they're reneging on all their agreements regarding Brexit. They're just not trustworthy. And, uh, you know, you have to feel far, sorry for the English people who are, I mean, these educated uh, Tory conservative MPs with all of their private education, they don't care one bit about the average English man in the street, the working class man. 
They don't care about them. And ultimately, I think that's going to be their downfall. We hope. However, you know, so what I really am saying is that, like, we don't hate the English. They're a lovely people. Um, I like to go visit London. I love it when they come to visit our beautiful Ireland. We just don't want them in our government. They just need to keep their governing powers to themselves. So. Well said. Are the McBride principles working at all? Um, I, I don't really think so. Yeah, you know, I don't. I have to just be honest and say no, I don't think so. Well, the man has worked so hard. Yeah. yeah, there are so many things that have, you know, been signed up to and, and they're just, you know. I'll try to put the pressure on the American companies that were doing it. Yeah, business in Northern Ireland. Yeah, to hire capital, make them hire the capital into the companies. I don't. Well, you know, the 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 North of Ireland is changing. That's one thing I have to say, and that's partly due to the demographics. I mean, there is a wonderful new generation of Irish young people, and they're becoming politicians. And you can see them, they're articulate, they have great ideas, they're passionate, and we all know change is coming. And, you know, the North is not the same as it was, you know, 20, 30 years ago. Uh, there's more equality there. And we all, I think, believe that there's going to be a United Ireland, hopefully in the next five years or so. So I do have to say that things are changing there. Um, but with regard to legacy and on happened before there's nothing any other questions or we'll hand it back over to you excellent job thank you thank you thank you that was great Trish, as always and uh I get a feeling we might be zooming in again to Alma <laughs> and having a few more speakers from over there. Uh, just before we close, um, I want to just comment on something you know, Trish brought up about the Miami show band. I'm sure a lot of people here remember, or don't remember, I mean, have experienced uh, a concert with John Connors and the Irish Express. Oh, yeah. John mm -hmm. Connors played for Irish Northern Aid Benefit concerts for years. His cousin was one of the people in the Miami show band. I remember when it happened, he was shortly thereafter was playing at Patrick's for a thing we were having. And just a horrible nightmare that he went through. And it was so recent that there was none of this information. All the New York Times, the British BBC had it that the Miami show band was carrying a bomb across the border for the IRA and it blew up prematurely. That is what was all over the newspaper. It was months before it came out what Trish said. And of course they didn't name names like Trish did, but that's, you know, going back to the George Floyd thing, that is what happens when a state goes rogue and they can just kill indiscriminately. And we all have to guard against that. But John Connors is still around and God bless him, he's still rocking and rolling. Uh, okay, listen, just uh, some things in the future that we can look forward to uh, that I mentioned about the next couple of lectures, but October 30th, which is next Sunday, is a rally, speeches and song at a block party in Hamden, Connecticut. The rally is to try to save the Irish Great Hunger Museum, that's at Quinnipiac College. No longer are people trying to save it at Quinnipiac College. They're trying to get it relocated to another place. And anybody who's interested, Hanbury is not that far away. Uh, a lot, a lot of Irish American groups have coalesced around this and serious efforts are being made to have the whole contents of the museum transferred somewhere else. So if anyone's interested in that type of thing, that would be a good, uh, uh, thing to, to go to. On November 5th, uh, in Rhode Island here, the, the Rhode Island Remembers the Fenians Committee is having a commemoration of the 100th anniversary of the death of James McNally Wilson, who was uh, exiled to Australia and then rescued 
with a group of other Fenians from Australia and brought to America on a ship called the Catalba that sailed out of New Bedford, Connecticut, which is a half hour away from here. And James Wilson spent the rest of his life in Central Falls. He's buried in Pawtucket and he's quite an inspiration. We have uh, a friend of ours who has done great research on the people who were saved on the Catalba. But next on uh, November 6th, uh, November 5th, I'm sorry, is a Saturday afternoon at one o'clock at no, St. Mary's. Friday. That's a Friday. Okay, let's make it the sixth then. That's a Saturday. And at one o'clock at St. Mary's Cemetery, there is a grave marker that has been erected for James McNally Wilson. There's going to be a uh, commemoration of some sort, uh, a blessing. They're trying to get bagpipers and things like that. Then at two o'clock, there's going to be a fundraiser over at the Galway Bay as George and his committee is trying to get two more grave markers for two other people from the Catalba that are buried in Calvary Cemetery. I think it's in Queens, New York. It's in New York City anyway. And uh, they're very close to getting that money. Anybody that can go over there that day and drop a 10 or a 20 into the basket will bring that, mu that, that much closer. And our own group in the 1916 committee, December 5th, we're having a fundraiser at Patrick's Pub. The fundraiser is to raise more funds to build a hunger strike monument uh, at a place to be determined. And uh, we have the Irish Ramblers will be playing that day. It's a Sunday afternoon. Very important to note the Patriots are playing on Monday night. So there'll be no interference with that. And the gig is going to go from two to five, which accommodates our uh, new lifestyles, I think. So anyway, that's that. If anybody has any questions or comments. Raffle. We have a raffle in the back. That's how we pay the musician downstairs. So please buy some tickets and uh, carry on. We got the Red Sox on downstairs. Marie. Tomorrow at 10 a.m. next door to the Irish Famine Memorial is the Beirut 8 Memorial. And they're having a service tomorrow at 10 o'clock, a remembrance. They have a beautiful, beautiful monument down, or monuments so more than that. Okay. All right. That's it. We'll see everybody next month. Read the emails, follow up on what we're doing. Keep fighting for a free and united Isle. <laughs>